Good morning, Pleasant Hill Church of God. Good morning. Good morning. So, every witty thing that I was going to say to you first thing this morning has left my mind. So if you happen to find it laying around the church somewhere, please let me know so I can use it, use it another time, maybe. So instead, we're going to stand up and we're going to start praising the Lord right away. If we can just ask the Lord to make us less like me, more like him. Try my best, but just don't get it right. Where I talk a talk that I don't want, miss the moments right before my eyes. Somebody with a hurt that I could have helped, somebody with a hand that I could have helped. When I just can't see past myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like Pass myself, Lord, help me be a little more like mercy, a little more like grace, a little more like kindness, goodness, love and faith, a little more like patience, a little more like peace, a little more like Jesus, a little less like me. need we always need God there when things are going wrong or the things are going right but when they're going wrong we ask God turn it around Turn this thing around. God's 
turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. Calling on the name, it's free to everything. Sorry, God turn it around, God turn it around, God turn it around. Good morning. It's great to see you all in God's house uh, on this Sunday morning. A uh, couple of announcements. Don't forget to pick up a bulletin on your way out. You haven't got one yet. It uh, has all the news, all the prayer needs and everything in the bulletin, so make sure you grab one. Also, today we are uh, going to uh, celebrate communion here in a little bit, so we'll be doing that. And uh, at this time, I'd like to read to you from the book of Ephesians, in chapter 5, verse 15. It says, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit 
speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This time, if our deacons will come forward, we'll receive our morning offering. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that we can be in your house and uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, as we gather in this place, it is our prayer that you would be in our hearts and in our minds, that you, Lord, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would open our eyes, Lord. And Father, I ask now that uh, you would uh, bless those who give this morning, and I pray, Lord, that the, these tithes and offerings would be um, used for your glory in this world. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So Pastor Appreciation, Pastor Scott is devoted to giving so much. God only knows all the souls that he has touched. He is committed to serve, and he has answered God's call. And he's proved it by being a servant to all. We appreciate you, and thank you so much. So this week, um, we have a bag of thank yous and appreciations for Pastor Scott from our congregation. And I'm going to do a reading of number 6, 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Our dear Pastor Scott, God has called you, chosen you, ordained you, gifted you, equipped you, anointed you, instructed you, guided you, enabled you, blessed you, and you have returned it all to us, and we thank you. You met me at my lowest moment You saw me at my very worst and When I expected disappointment Love was all I heard Cause my sin was deep your grace was deeper and my shame was wide your arms were wide and my guilt was great your love was greater still you ran to me when I was naked you clothed me you pulled me from the depths of darkness into your light again. Go into your light again. As my sin was deep, your grace was deeper, and my shame was wide.
Obviously, we've seen all the things that are going on with Israel and the Middle East, and and a lot of there are pastors that are out there saying that there's a, there's a lot of prophecy to see in this, and, and it's quite possible. So, uh, we could be afraid for the future, but if you have Christ in in your life, then there is no fear this future. But this is what is to come. The song is called "Fear Is Not My Future." It's a new song. To stand. <laughs> yeah. Should be easy to sing. <laughs> Just open up and just receive 
amen, that new horizon.
Dear Lord, we know you're the same God. We know you're the same God that was there in that Old Testament, the same God that's there in the New Testament. There is, there is no difference. You haven't changed. And Father God, we need to always learn the ways in both those books of how your love and your grace has always been there. Father God, may we always turn to you. Father God, open our hearts to receive the message that is today and to receive this, the bread and the wine. Father God, I thank you so much for all the blessings that you pour upon us as we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If I could have the deacons come forward this morning, we'll start our communion service. Take time and bow this morning. Give a blessing for the cup and the bread this morning. Dear Lord and Father, we come to you giving you thanks and praise for all you do for us each and every day of each of our lives. We thank you especially now that we can remember this service, remember the blessings you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ, his willingness to sacrifice for each of us for the things that we do daily, and most of all, for the plan that you have for each of us in the future. May you be with us, guide us, and direct us, especially as a church. Let us be spreading your gospel in Jesus' name. While they're passing these out, I can't imagine anyone not watching the news this week as we see all of these things going on around us. It's, it's kind of interesting because I just finished in my Sunday school class for the junior and senior high, the ones that are in my class, we just finished going over some of the end times, you know, and we've been discussing that. And now that the, all the news came out, we've started discussing that also. So it's kind of hard not to bring it up in, in everyday life. But I think the most interesting thing is, you know, the God that followed after Israel in the times of old is still the same God that's with them today. It may be a strange plan that none of us quite understand, but I think the, the Bible's pretty adamant about giving us what the end result is. Whether we are caught up with it, whether it's happening now or whether it's in the future, it's still God's plan, no matter what. A lot of people are discouraged and upset and worried it's like reading a good book. We know what the end is, right? And I think that's the encouraging part. And I think that's a part of why we remember this. To give us hope. If not, what else, right? So, just as in my class, and I've had n numerous questions that I'm not sure I'm good enough to answer sometimes. A lot of people are having these same questions today. Don't be afraid to tell someone. There is hope. And it's right here in our hand today. With that, I'd like to open the cup where it says the, the, the bread in the back side there. Take out the bread. Or take over the bread together. Christ told the disciples also, after partaking of the bread, open the cup. Let's partake of the cup also.
while they're collecting that. As I, as I mentioned, there's so many questions out there today. I encourage each of you to look for an answer. No matter whether you're here or sitting at home, look for an answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those who. Uh, yeah. And as they're heading out, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, and the second Psalm. The second Psalm, Psalm 2, and this, ver this Psalm is 12 verses long. I'm going to read them all to you this morning. And it says, Why are the nations in an uproar? I think the King James says, Why do the heathen rage? But why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers take counsel together against, his lo against the Lord and his anointed, saying, Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who s sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them, and he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that He not become angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are those, all those who take refuge in Him. Let's pray before we continue. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that we can look into your word this day. And Father, as we look into your word and we consider the things happening in our world, may we make that connection and see that your word is still very much alive, very much speaking to us 
right now today. And Father, that the wisdom we have here is, is everlasting. And Father, I ask now that you would cleanse me, make me a worthy vessel to proclaim your word this day. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. It's, it's interesting that this psalm is talking about Israel. Verse 6, Psalm 1, For as for me, I've installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. That's the city of Jerusalem. The city of Jerusalem. You know, shocking events have been unfolding in Israel. and We don't know in the immediate future what's going to happen. You know, whether it will be a wider war in the Middle East or, or this thing will calm down after a time. But we, we look at, at Israel and we see Israel as a tiny nation, as a little sliver of land surrounded by peoples who want to destroy it. And it's interesting, you know, Israel is that nation that was created by God. You know, and, and in some ways, this desire to destroy Israel, to wipe it off the face of the earth, is this connected with it, this desire to defy God. You know, some Bible scholars believe that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 were traditionally always read together. And if you remember last week, we, we, we looked at Psalm 1, and uh, I'm relying on your memory of my sermon last week on the first psalm, when one of the important verses of the first psalm is, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the seat of sinners, or, or walk in the path of sin in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by streams of water. And also, remember, it says, The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The first psalm presents us with a study in contrast, really. The way of the wicked, the way of the righteous. One, there's one and then there's the other. One finds strength in the Word of God, while the other rejects God's wisdom for themselves. The destiny of, destiny of one leads to life, and the destiny of the other leads to destruction. And so this second psalm that we're looking at today continues with this study in contrast. And we, you know, one question we might have for ourselves is, why do people reject the Lord? Why do people reject God's wisdom for themselves? Why do they reject God's purpose? And, and, and in some ways, connect with that, why do they hate God's people? Why do they reject God's authority? You know, the second psalm, as I mentioned, has a sense of, there's a sense of timelessness about it. Humankind's relationship with God has always been characterized by our rebellion, by our mistrust, by our impatience, by our sometimes outright hostility to the Lord. The second psalm describes the rebellion of man against his creator. The psalm ponders the folly and the foolishness of hating the very one who has generously given us life, given us life each and every day. The psalmist, King David, is perplexed and confused in the opening words of the psalm. He says, why are the nations in an uproar? And why do the peoples devise a vain thing? And we can look around at our world today, we see the hate, we see the war, we see the violence, we see the rage, and we wonder why. Why are people acting this way? You know, in some ways for David, this is an odd turn of events. You know, why are they devising a vain thing? How could this be? How could human beings reject the very one who created them, the very one who's striving to save them? How could they rebel against his word? How could they not believe the one who gives them life day to day? How could they not recognize the authority of the Almighty? Psalm 2 describes 
a very tragic and sad state of affairs. However, what is true then is still very true today. Again, there's a timelessness about this Psalm 2. This hatred of God is a vain thing. This rebelling against God will eventually come to nothing. That's what it means. It's vain. God, the Lord, knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You may not realize it, but the second psalm is actually has been very important in the faith of Christians and in the church. Did you know around 60% of Psalm 2 that we just read is quoted in the New Testament again? The early church saw the ministry of Jesus and his second coming through the lens of this second psalm. And I'll try to demonstrate why that is. Apart from direct quotations, some familiar themes from the Old New Testament find their origin right here. For instance, the Christian belief that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. It, it began right here. In Psalm 2-7, it proclaims, it proclaims to the Messiah or the anointed, Thou art my Son, today I have begotten Thee. Notice also the words of Psalm 2-2. In that verse, the kings of the earth, it says, rebel against the Lord and His anointed. The Hebrew word anointed is that same word, Messiah. And the, you know, we think about Messiah, in the New Testament is often used the word Christ, which is the Greek equivalent of the Messiah. That Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one, finds its origin in this very verse. The anointed is the man who's been chosen by God to rule as king over the whole earth. Jesus has been chosen to rule by God. You know, the core beliefs of Christianity are in this very psalm. The first three verses of Psalm 2, in those first three verses, the anger, the rage, the outright hostility that are directed towards the Lord and is anointed by the, king, by the kings and the rulers of this earth who are the representatives of the human race. You know, they, they're rebelling against God. And you might wonder, what's the issue at hand? Why are they so angry? Well, it's rather simple. They absolutely will not recognize the authority of God or His appointed king. They say in one accord, they say, let us, let us tear let us tear their fetters apart and cast their cords from us. We don't want to be restrained by the Lord anymore. They want to be free from God and free from His Word. They will not recognize God's authority or God's anointed King. These words capture, I think, the response of the human race towards the authority of God. We don't want to do things God's way. That's why we have violence and rage and hatred. You know, we see it every day. The human race as a whole no longer has patience for the Word of God or the authority of God. We react with hostility when confronted with truth. We no longer can endure the sound teaching of the Word of God. We will not live by it, will not live by its words. You know, in Acts 4, verses 25 and 26, again from the New Testament, Peter the Apostle actually quoted wholesale from Psalm 2, verses 1 through 3. In Acts, Paul, Peter observed this. He says, Who, by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said, Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. And then Peter continues, For truly in this city they are gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. You know, so Peter observed that the Gentiles, the nations, raged against Jesus, against God and his anointed. Peter correctly concluded that the Gentiles and the people of Israel had raged against God's Messiah. 
They have rejected God by rejecting the Savior. They condemned Jesus and nailed Him to the cross. And we, the human race, killed the Savior and the King that God gave to us. And what a tragedy. Why did they kill Him? Well, they refused to acknowledge the authority of God's anointed, the Messiah, the Christ. And by extension, they also rejected the authority of the God who sent Jesus. What a tragic event. You know, as I said before, it's usually said that Christ died for our sins, which is very true. However, it's equally true that Jesus died because we are sinners. The human race is sinners. Jesus was killed because we are sinners. We rejected the Lord and His anointed. This is the nature of sinful human beings, both past, present, and in the future. And in reference to the future, Revelation 19.19 describes how the beast or the Antichrist and the kings of the earth will make a vain stand against Jesus when He returns in glory. However, their hostility towards God will come to nothing. In Psalm 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, The Lord laughs at their rebellion, because God is always God. He is the Creator. He sustains us day by day. And God's will is ultimately irresistible. God, in defiance to the rebellion of the human race, proclaims in Psalm 2, verse 6, the Lord says, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. God has chosen the one who will rule over the earth. God told the Messiah, the anointed, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Jesus is the king whom God has chose, chosen to rule. And Jesus is not only the king, but he is the very son of God. And to his son, God makes this very generous offer in Psalm 2, verses 8 and 9. He says, ask of me, and I'll surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. If you've ever read the book of Revelation, those words I just read may sound familiar. Revelation 19.15 describes the return of Jesus Christ in glory and power. And it reads this. It says, From his mouth, from Christ's mouth comes a sharp sword, so with it he might strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. This brings the mind to words of Psalm 1-6. You know, the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. In Mark chapter 1, verses, verse 14, Jesus began His earthly ministry with these very simple and direct words to the whole human race. He says, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent. Get right with God. Submit to the Lord and believe His word. Believe in God's anointed King and Savior. These words echo the advice of Psalm 2. Psalm 2 reads, verses 10 and 11 reads this way. It says, Now, it says, Now therefore, kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. The kings and the judges here are representatives of the whole human race. They are called to model the right attitude towards the Lord. Show discernment. Get smart. Think about your present course. Consider where your decisions are taking you. Stop resisting the Word of God. Repent, repent before it's too late. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Psalm 2 verse 12 warns this, Do homage to the Son, that He not become angry and you perish in the way 
or his wrath may soon be kindled. As I mentioned earlier, there's a very deep connection between the first and the second psalm. The last line takes the form of a promise. Blessed are all those who take refuge in Him. Speaking of the Son. These words connect us with the very first words of Psalm 1-1. How blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. This clear connection helps us understand both psalms, I think, more deeply. To take refuge in the Lord is to reject the counsel of the wicked and to live instead by the Word of God. To take refuge in the Lord is to be obedient to His Word. It's to trust the Lord. It's to repent. And this is what it means, I think, to take refuge in the Lord. For a day of reckoning is coming, and as we look around our world and we see how quickly these things can happen, we have to think about that, don't we? For a day of reckoning is coming. His wrath may soon be kindled. And so it's time for each of us, as we see what's happening in the other side of the world, it's time for us to consider our ways. Again, there's this connection, I think, between the first and the second psalm. But remember the last words of Psalm 1-6. It says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So think about those things today. This time, uh, if our worship team would like to come up back up, we'll um, have our closing song. kid and (laughs) you're like oh man all these people are out here saying oh not my kid and i'm standing up in front of everybody great is he good he's good all right good if you guys like to stand with us we're gonna sing i'm listening I don't have 
Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we truly don't want to miss one word you speak because your words are life to us. And Father, I, I ask now as we, as we contemplate these things, that Father, that we might have a peace within us that, that you give us, that you give us a calm and an assurance and a confidence in you. For you are the way to life. Let us take refuge in your son and the storm that is coming and the storm that now is. Let us trust in you. I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And let me ask, are there any...